All right, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Crypto 101 Podcast. I'm your host, Bryce. As always, joined by my notorious co-host, Mr. Brendan Veeman. How's it going, buddy? You know, Bryce, it is going good, but we can't ignore what's happening in the markets. So today, <laughs> we brought in a specialist, someone I am very excited to talk to. Oh, Isn't that right, Bryce? Absolutely. Somebody who absolutely made a tidal wave on the scene uh, Mr. James Safert, who is the ETF analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence, joining us today. James, how are you doing? And thanks for coming on. Hey, guys. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm doing pretty good. Can't complain too much. <laughs> yeah, it's been, a, it's been a world in the last couple of weeks. Uh, been a long, uh, long few days, I guess I would say. I was hoping it'd slow down, but it hasn't really slowed down too much yet. But it's a little bit better than it was <laughs> the week of launch. <laughs> and I, I just feel like, you know, probably ever since June 15th, your life got turned upside down. Um, you know, t tell us about, catch us up the past six months, you go from just, you know, a normal ETF analyst at Bloomberg intelligence, crunching the numbers, seeing the scene, all of a sudden BlackRock hits the wire and they say, we're launching Bitcoin ETF. What goes through your mind? Yeah. So, I mean, honestly, even before that, I was covering this whole thing back to 2017. So like, this has been oh, an area of wow. coverage of mine and interest for mine for, for a while. Um, so I was covering all of the failed attempts over from 2017 <laughs> till 2021 when, when Grayscale was ultimately denied. Uh, so I've been covering it for a while, but I was actually, uh, when BlackRock filed, I, that, I was actually, um, my, my girlfriend moved to uh, St. Louis and we were actually like driving like the day before <laughs> I was driving her to St. Louis. So I literally, I was supposed to be off on vacation, but I did at least, I don't even know how many. <laughs> Twitter spaces and podcasts and like tons of client calls who were like, what are the odds this actually happens? And we we're so I literally spent like two days of driving and the whole time, like a staggering majority of it. I was like talking to clients and people about this. So she was not too happy, but That's uh, so funny. it's been a whirlwind ever since. And we've been fortunate enough to be right on, on our calls on that front, at least. Yeah. And, and, and you, like you said, you've been doing this since 2017. And I, I really you know saw you blow up on the scene kind of around the, the past six month <clears throat> period. And I'm curious, like when you are giving all this intelligence at Bloomberg, you've got clients, are these, you know, other hedge funds who are like looking to you and saying, hey, we want to trade the market, um, you know, tell us your odds or like who, who hires you? Yeah, I mean, well, like, so our, our, the way that Bloomberg Intelligence works is like our research is behind a paywall, essentially, we're all on the Bloomberg terminal. So if you pay for a Bloomberg terminal, um, which most of the traditional financial world, those hedge funds, uh, traders that you're talking about, they have access to any, any research that comes out of Bloomberg Intelligence. So we have equity stock analysts, we have just equity strategists, commodity strategists, uh, rate strategists, credit strategists, you name it. So one, they, my area is specifically ETFs or the asset management industry. So we cover mutual funds and ETFs mostly because they're public and you can see a lot of the data, but we do a little bit of coverage of like the hedge fund world too. But most of the clients I'm talking to, it runs the gamut. So I'm talking to hedge funds that are literally trading this in the their actual portfolios, um, people just trying to understand what's happening in the space. A staggering number of people that I talk to are like their day job is more dealing with bonds or equities or something like that. And they're but for their personal portfolio, they're asking me questions about what's going on here. So that actually is not, it's not uncommon for us specifically, because like I said, we cover ETFs. A lot of people just use them in their personal portfolios to get exposure to the markets. Um, so it's not unusual to have somebody who's like maybe trading muni bonds asking us questions about ETFs. Okay. But this particular topic uh, has blown up and I've had never had more client interest in, in what we're covering and what I'm talking about than, than the Bitcoin ETF saga. Yeah, it's crazy that, I mean, just the amount of interest that it's gotten uh, this Bitcoin ETF, you know, BlackRock, Fidelity, Wisdom Tree, all these big names, they now kind of legitimize crypto and, and kind of bring it into the same sphere as uh, the traditional world. And that's kind of where you got your, your start. I'm curious, like, you know, at what point did you make the I know you said 2017, you've been tracking it. But at what point did you become maybe, a, you know, a skeptic just in the traditional financial world? You know, maybe is Bitcoin just, you know, not a real thing to then you became a full on believer. Uh, yeah, if we're gonna go all the way back, I actually uh, <laughs> I, go I went back. to the, I went to the college in New Jersey and I graduated in 2014. But my freshman year, my sweet mate uh, downloaded Bitcoin mining software onto my laptop in 2011, spring of 2011. Uh, so that was my first experience with it, and I'm convinced to this day that that crashed my laptop. Uh, <laughs> I lost that hard, that hard drive. I lost like a 12 page paper. It was a nightmare. I've told the story to other places. So I apologize if anyone's heard it, but that was my first experience. And I was like, this is stupid fake internet money. And, um, 
that was, and then I didn't really start taking it more seriously until um, I was at a traditional financial conference from Morningstar, which is one of our competitors. And Kathy Wood, who runs ARK Investments, was giving a speech on Bitcoin and a white paper they had just wrote about it in um, early fall of 2016. And that's when I started paying attention again and really diving in uh, into early 2017-ish. And then um, when I joined Bloomberg Intelligence, which is uh, Bloomberg's research arm, like I said, this are all of Bloomberg Intelligence. We are, there's 300, 400 different analysts that cover different parts of the market, wow. individual wow. equities, individual stocks, you, you name it. Um, my area, again, is asset management. But um, when I came over, I reported to two people. I reported to Mike McGlone, who was our commodity strategist, and I reported to Baltunas, who's my boss and colleague covering the ETF world. and um, on the commodity side, it was like September-ish of 2017 or October where things were, re- I don't know how well people remember that, but that was when things were going crazy with Bitcoin. It was like trading at like, it was a head bend. It was a big deal. It was trading at like $3,000 earlier in the year and this thing just started skyrocketing. He's like, we need yeah. to start covering this from a commodities perspective. Do you know anything about this? And I was like, ah, oh, actually I do. And my, my <laughs> colleague, at, my other colleague at the time who was also very interested personally, went on to, uh, he helped us bring up the coverage on that front. Uh, but he actually went on to found Del- Delphi Digital, which is a, a big wow. player in the space. Uh, so I have a, a lot of my colleagues um, in Bloomberg Intelligence or Bloomberg in general um, are actually founders at Delphi Digital now, uh, for anyone who knows who they are. Um, so yeah, that was that was the initial coverage. And then obviously the fact that I was covering ETFs in the asset management industry and covering cryptos from the commodity strategy perspective, uh, these types of funds, the grayscale trusts, these ETFs, these exchange traded funds uh, fit like squarely in that overlap, those overlapping circles in that diagram, the Venn diagram. Yeah, I mean, James, like you said, this has been something that has been in the works. Like you specifically have been working with this thing since 2017, now pushing six, seven years. But like for the people who are out there listening, what goes into a successful ETF launch and why does that matter for Bitcoin? Um. So there, I, I literally couldn't sit here but could tell you what goes into it. I, we'd, we'd be here for the entire episode <laughs> of the podcast. But there's there's a lot of things that go into it, I'll just yeah. say. So you got to realize, like, people have been trying to get this thing selected. I mean, the Winklevoss filed initially in 2013 when Bitcoin was under $100. Wow. Uh, right. To be fair, that initial application was never going to be approved. We don't need to get into the details of the weeds why. But I think from about 2020 onward that the applications probably should have been approved if the SEC stuck to the normal standards, possibly even slightly earlier. Um, that said, there's a lot of lawyers that go on the back end. There's a lot of salespeople. Uh, so there's the wholesalers are the types of people that work at these asset management companies and try to sell to larger institutions or advisor networks. Um, so advisors are the people that like, if you hire somebody to help you with your manage your personal portfolio or your certified financial planners or, or what have you. Um, so these wholesalers would go to them and be like, look at our funds. These are what we're trying to sell. So that's part of it. Um, but you need a whole bunch of other things to come together at the right time. You need to have a, a decent track record. In this case, because it's tracking an asset, how well is it tracking the asset? Uh, how much in assets do you have? A lot of times it's like, you need to have a certain level of assets before I'll put my client's money in there. You need to have a track record. How long has it been existing? And they do a whole bunch of due diligence. So there's a whole long process that needs to happen before a lot of these bigger institutions are going to buy and really build up. But we've already seen in the first seven days of trading, this thing is traded almost $19 billion, which is immense liquidity. That's almost institutional level liquidity on on multiple products. Um, There's billions of dollars in these things. Uh, There's a lot of money shifting around. There's a lot of recycling of money from Grayscale's GBTC into some of these. We call the other, there's 10 ETFs that launched. We call the other nine, the newborn nine, because we're trying to separate out like what's going on with Grayscale, because Grayscale basically came over as a full-grown adult. They had $28 $28 billion in assets. They were trading a couple hundred million dollars a day. Um, so that was all important. Uh, so we're trying to see how the race is playing out with the the other contestants in the race, if you will. Um, but there's a whole bunch of education also goes into it. You need to make sure you're educating the masses on like how these things work. Um, and um, yeah, there's a whole, there's all these different levers that they can pull. Fees are obviously important to many, many investors, but so is liquidity and trading spreads. Um, so there's a lot of different things that can go into making these competitive. But what's unique about this situation is we've never had 11 ETFs or 10 ETFs at the same exact time launch virtually functionally identical products competing mm-hmm. with each other. So there's a whole bunch of like, it's like a case study for, for mm-hmm. us ETF nerds trying to figure out like what actually matters and what people are drawn to. Um, so yeah, that's, there's a whole, I could keep talking, but I'll stop there because <laughs> we'll just go down a rabbit hole. 
Well, no, I think that adds a lot of clarity. I mean, a lot of people are, are out there and wondering, like, you know, what's the big deal with the Bitcoin ETF? And you just said what? Like, it's not an easy feat to get one of these um, published and approved, you know, let alone the sheer transaction volume that's accompanied, accompanied this and all of them getting approved pretty much at the exact same time. It's just, again, its own milestone in and of itself. So now that we have it behind us, now that the Bitcoin ETFs have been approved, you know, what would you say kind of came from that launch? Would you say that it was overall successful? You know, did anything surprise you about it? Did it go exactly as planned? You know, what was your perspective of it? I would say it was a very successful. Um, I was always worried about the liquidity and the liquidation overhang from GBTC. We knew that mm -hmm. a lot of uh, bankruptcy estates, a lot of big institutions had serious money. Um, tied up in GBTC and we're not going to sell until that discount was gone. So GBTC used to trade at a 50% discount to its underlying value. So basically like if Bitcoin was trading at $10,000, you had to sell your GBTC shares for the equivalent of $5,000 for some, in some cases. Now that discount is virtually zero. So anyone who had money tied up in that was never going to sell while the discount didn't exist. And the ETF wrapper itself is what makes these things super efficient because you can create new shares or redeem shares on a daily basis, which we can get into in a little bit. But um, but really, it's been it's been very successful. Uh, obviously, there's still time to figure out. I'm more focused on the 12 to 18 month. I know most people are like, oh, what's going on right now? Day to day. We have when some more data now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. People people are looking at the price and, and freaking out about what's going on. But um, they're just part of the ETFs are just part of the market, right? Like they are not Granted, they are a big slice of the pie now, uh, particularly with trading volume and and actual Bitcoin that's stored. But for the most part, it's like the ETFs are big pieces of pie for the entire market, whether it's equity or bonds. And like you don't look at the flows into equity ETFs and be like, why why, why are flows coming in? But the stock market is going down like that's just people in the crypto world yeah. need to realize like they're just piece of the pie. Right. So if you look at like Bitcoin futures, which are deriv the derivatives of Bitcoin futures that trade on the CME. I mean, the the open interest or the amount of dollars invested is down one point seven billion dollars since launch. One um, hundred and thirty plus thousand Bitcoin um, that wow. technically had exposure on the futures are just gone. So a lot of people were buying these things in approve in expecting an approval, um, an ETF approval. So there's a lot of just unwinding of those types of trades. But overall, there's been a lot of liquidity. The spreads have been tight. The discounts and premiums are compressing. Um, uh, <laughs> everything yeah. has been moderately successful. That said, the one thing I'll point out is um, the most recent data we have from Grayscale is uh, GBTC is they had a $640 million outflow, um, which is the, the record daily outflow we've seen from them. But for so far, for the most part, we're still net positive about $1.1 billion on these spot ETFs. Um, wow. So money in the aggregate is is still coming into the space. Now, it remains to be seen if that can continue, if Grayscale <laughs> continues hemorrhaging money, but um, we'll be watching. And, and I want to know, like, you know, how did um, the market participant kind of nature of crypto change with this ETF? Like, is this a paradigm shifting moment because there's a new subset of buyers? And if so, who? Because I know like, ET like hedge funds probably aren't really buying the ETF. They're comfortable enough, you know, holding their own wallets, um, you know, high net worth individuals, maybe not buy the ETF because they could, you know, start up a Coinbase. Like who's really buying these things? Uh, really anyone. Like that's what makes ETFs the, in our view, the best, like we refer to it as a technology. It's really a wrapper, but it's the best wrapper out there for investing in pretty much any asset you can think of. So the benefit of the ETF is like everyone's playing in the same pool, right? Like you don't have hedge funds with special special uh, abilities to do certain things or cheaper fees. You don't have high, net, high institutions or high net worth individuals that get beneficial treatment. Like you or your grandmother are playing in the same pool and getting the same deal as the hedge fund on Wall Street, right? Like, so spreads are tight. There's no commissions mostly on these ETFs, depending on where you're buying them. Um, mm -hmm. And the fees are, are being driven down very low. So who's buying them? So the one thing that often get asked is like, how like this is going to be great because it's open up people to investing. For the most part, retail people, well, these are the, your audience, like if they really wanted exposure to Bitcoin, they could have downloaded Coinbase or Kraken or mm -hmm. hopefully not FTX or something along those lines, right? Like they've yeah. had the ability to get access to this. What this really opens is people who didn't want to go through that process, one, 
which I, if you really, like I said, if you really wanted exposure, you, you had it already. Um, but if you're just thinking like, well, like a lot of people are thinking, I want to put like 2% of my portfolio in this, maybe 5%. It's way easier just to buy this ETF in your traditional brokerage account, particularly if you're using a self-directed IRA, like a tax advantage account in the US. Um, this just makes it easier. Institutions, a lot of times they aren't allowed to invest in these types of things like Bitcoin specifically. And putting in the ETF wrapper would mean that a lot of institutions can actually hold this if they really wanted. Other ETFs, other mutual funds now, if they couldn't hold Bitcoin before, they can now do it in the most efficient manner, which is these spot Bitcoin ETFs. Um, but the real, the real people buying these things, in my view, over the long term, the real addressable market that's expanded here is advisors, those people I was talking about. Because in many cases, they work. They have like platforms that they're associated with. So they have people that do the back end work, the the back office type stuff, maybe even middle office stuff. And then they have a platform where they can buy these things through them, whether it's UBS, Merrill Lynch, um, you name it, right? Like they, they have all these different Morgan Stanley. Like there's they they use them on the back end of of what they're trying to do. There are some smaller independent REAs that might be have buying this already for their clients, but for the most part, some of them even had like exposure to be able to get these things, get exposure to Bitcoin if they wanted via something like a Swan or Galaxy or OnRamp where they can basically tie into the back end. But that's like a whole bunch of other hoops that you have to jump through, a lot of extra work. And if you're really thinking about putting this in like 2% of your portfolio, something like that, or 5% of your portfolio, do you really want to be spending a significant chunk of your time on a regular basis, like setting all this up? Or is it just easier to pay the 20 bips fee, which honestly, right now it's a 0% fee. Um, which might be cheaper than a lot of those those offerings had in the past anyway. And you just have to do it on the traditional rails, like the original financial rails that you're used to using as an advisor. So this just makes it way easier for them if they want exposure. So we think there's going to be a decent amount of advisors who, for a subset of their clients, will go this route that would not have gone any other way um, to, to get exposure to the asset class. Yeah, it sounds like uh, the doors really are blown open and, uh, you know, short term fluctuations, they're going to exist. But long term is is like what you mentioned, where you focus. So I'm kind of just curious, um, give us some context for like how you're expecting flows over the next, like I think you said 12 to 18 months is kind of what you're looking at. How, how should we think about how much these things are going to have under management annually? So it's hard to know. I, I'm not going to give like an AUM prediction really, or I, I think 50 could be somewhere. But the problem with AUM is it changes with two things, right? Flows, that those creations and redemptions I was talking about, money coming in or out. That's organic demand, right? That's either people leaving or people coming in. That's easy to see. That happens on a daily basis. Assets can change with two things. It can change with flows, but also appreciation or depreciation of the asset. So if Bitcoin goes up or down, the AUM is going to move with it. So it's harder to pick AUM, particularly with something as volatile as Bitcoin. Um, so our prediction really was in the first year, we thought 10 billion might come into these ETFs on a net basis. Um, but again, that's like just strictly looking at flows and organic demand um, for these products. And we're not going to make any price predictions. I, honestly, even if I could, I, one, I'm not allowed to, and two, even if I could, I probably wouldn't. <laughs> um so i forgot did that answer your question what was the yeah what was yeah, the absolutely. Was the yeah yeah 10, 10 billion dollars of inflows into these things over the first first year kind of sounds about right yeah. and oh yeah let and uh this is the other part i was i was saying so those platforms i was talking about and i've hinted at this they have like requirements there's teams that do due diligence they understand how all these work on the back end they're trying to figure out the differences between the different etfs they're trying to make sure that certain levels of different things are met and the way a lot of these platforms work is like you don't just launch an etf and it's automatically allowed to be sold to advisors advisors can just click buy for the clients in many cases it's the exact opposite once it's launched it has to go through a process before it can be bought so there's usually like a, a waterfall list of like you can buy this, no questions asked, just hit buy. Or like maybe you have to jump through some hoops. And then new stuff for the most part is on this no do not buy list where you cannot buy pretty much under any circumstances. But if there's clients asking for them to do it and different things like that, they can get through different loopholes. But for the most part, the the real goal for a lot of these ETF issuers is to get these ETFs on that, that green light list where basically anyone can just click buy. But there's a lot of these platforms that will not allow that. Um, and it will take some time before they do allow these ETFs onto that onto that list, I guess. Yeah. No, I, I definitely know uh, Vanguard isn't allowing uh, the Bitcoin ETF because it doesn't kind of share their 
whatever philosophy yeah. about cash flows only and, and you know how, how should you know how should us at home kind of think about that um i mean i guess they're a free com- or a free market company privately whatever they could do whatever they want um but how do you kind of think about that do you think that's a misstep do you think that's kind of the right move for their business yeah so i was actually so two things one i constantly get asked is vanguard going to launch one and my answer is always no no shot they don't even have a gold etf like you mentioned they they want cash flows they don't they don't believe in financial assets without cash flows otherwise it's just a commodity and it's only what the next person will pay for it um mm-hmm. that is vanguard ethos uh, so i never thought they would launch a bitcoin etf never I see. um that said they do allow the buying of gold etfs on their platform so I was a little surprised that they decided they weren't going to allow people to buy the the crypto, the spot crypto ETFs on their platform, particularly because initially they were allowing people to buy the Bitcoin futures ETF, which is an inarguably yeah, hell, less right? efficient version. That said, this isn't the first time they've done something like this. Like you can't buy the three X leverage uh, gold miners ETF or natural gas ETF. Like they they have restrictions of what you can and can't buy on their platform. Christy. So it's not it's not mm. the first time they've done something like this. And the other part I would say is. Vanguard is the one that's slightly different from all the other platforms I was talking about. Vanguard, typically, they just add whatever you can trade. You can trade whatever, kind of similar to a Schwab or uh, Fidelity or whatever platform you you typically use. So this was a little surprising. But the other ones, like I said, the default is you can't buy this until we approve it, whereas many other places operate under you can buy this unless we don't approve it. So Vanguard usually operates on the ladder, but they're not on, in this case. And and honestly, it's... It, it kind of goes against their ethos. So it's not that surprising, um, but we'll see how it turns out. I, I don't think they'll be, they might change their minds at some point in the next uh, year or two, but uh, even even if they don't, I don't think it's going to be that critical of a situation. If anything, it might um, might draw more attention uh, mm-hmm. because like it's like, oh, you can't have this. And it's like, oh, now I want it and I'm going to go somewhere else to get it. <laughs> um, but we'll see. Yeah, James, you mentioned leverage and something that we've seen floating around out there is that there could be options on Bitcoin ETFs coming our way in the future. So I guess how likely is it that we'll actually see these things and what would that mean for the market in its entirety? So typically when an ETF launch happens under a normal ETF, um, you can just add options almost immediately. Bitto, the Bitcoin futures ETF launched. And it had options very quickly. Um, This is a different process. It has to kind of go through the same process that the ETFs had to go through. Um, It's called the 19 before process. And there's all these deadlines and delay periods. But at the end of 240 days, the SEC has to approve or deny. Um, Our expectation is they're just going to approve these things to have options at some point in the next month or so. Um, Time will tell. Um, So it could happen within the next month. Otherwise, it's probably I think the I think the end of September is the latest they can wait now for for a lot of these things to add options. And that will add leverage a little bit to the to, to the system, I guess, for sure. Um, <laughs> traders like they love volatile assets and trading trading options around them. So that'll just bring more liquidity to the space uh, and these ETFs in general. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, it, like I said, I think it could happen within the next month or so. And and kind of with that, um, like what else can we expect in terms of maybe even new crypto related ETFs? Um, I think I saw like a Bitcoin covered call strategy um, yep. that, that's going to be launching as an ETF. Was was that right? It's already launched. Yeah, Roundhill oh, wow. Roundhill launched it. Yep. And and kind of what else should we expect? Like, is there any uh, any other crypto related ETFs on your horizon? I, I mean, the Ethereum ETF is kind of the lo- the low hanging fruit, I would think. But um, anything else? Yeah, so YBTC is the Roundhill Bitcoin cover call strategy ETF. So they're going to use futures and do cover calls to kind of generate income. I think there'll be other ways to kind of generate income and do different things with derivatives around Bitcoin. No guarantee. Um, 7RCC is another company that was trying to launch with this first wave but couldn't get out. They are going to offer exposure to spot Bitcoin and carbon credits. So for anyone worried about the ESG concerns Mm -hmm. um, around Bitcoin, basically an institution can buy this and be set because you're going to have... offsetting positions to using carbon credits for the the Bitcoin that you hold in the CTF is the theory. So I think that'll launch in in the coming months, Um, maybe even month. Um, I have yet to see any movement on that, but it theoretically could come sooner because the SEC has already approved a bunch of these other things. Uh, So that will be one that we're watching. I'll be interested to see if they figure out other ways to basically lend out the underlying Bitcoin um, and earn income 
obviously some people here and that are going to be like ripping their heads off, but some people are like, no, I like the idea of generating income because it's pretty standard when you're doing it with equities or bonds, what have you. Um, that said, under the current structure, grant or trust, like they, they can't lend out the underlying assets, but uh, I wouldn't discount these um, really smart people in the ETF industry to figure out um, loopholes and workarounds to, to launch such products. Um, and as you hinted, Ethereum, that's the next one up on our list. I th they have a deadline in May 23rd, May 24th. Um, my view is we're around 65% that we think that, that those will get approved. Uh, no guarantee. Um, Gensler could basically just keep push kicking the can down the road, force things to go back to court, and basically eventually end up at the same situation they've ended up at with the Bitcoin ETFs, as far as I'm concerned. So ultimately, we will get an ETH ETF in the next year or two, I think. Um, but anything else, aside, like as far as other assets, my view is it's just Ethereum and then nothing else because the, the process we've gone for Bitcoin was the futures launched, then we had futures ETFs, and now we have the spot, and we have the same thing for Ethereum. There are no other futures. The SEC is calling a lot of other digital asset securities and their Coinbase lawsuit and their Kraken lawsuit and other lawsuits. Um, so my view personally is that they are kind of pivoting away from going after Bitcoin and Ethereum and focusing. They're basically, I think they will approve them. Uh, no guarantees. Like I said, our odds are nowhere near the 90% we were at with Bitcoin ETF. So, right. so take that with a grain of salt. But we, we think that's the path of least resistance and where they're going to go. And I think they'll approve those spot Ether ETFs. That said, there are differences with staking versus proof of work and a few other things. Um, there's a lot of minutia, minutia. There's a lot of minutia in the differences between Bitcoin and Ethereum that the SC will have to get comfortable with. But I think they'll approve them and then um, continue to wage war on the rest of the industry uh, in the courts. Um, but yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, th there's a couple avenues I want to go down there because I, I know one of the other guys that you work with, I, I think Elliot Stein, he, he's been uh, tracking the Coinbase. Uh, he, he's do he's the lawyer analyst uh, tracking the Coinbase court, giving Coinbase pretty high odds of beating the SEC or getting this, uh, you know, at some level um, dismissed. But I'm I'm curious, you know, going back to the SEC. Why, you know, what's the difference here that they care so much about between the commodity ETFs and the security ETFs? Um, and, and, you know, how does Bitcoin kind of, you know, play as only a commodity ETF? And will there ever be security Bitcoin ETFs? So, not really. Um, that's, that's really in the weeds. Um, Sorry. <laughs> no worries. I mean, can, can you can you can you ask it again? Let me let me think about it real quick. Sorry. Yeah, I guess I guess I guess I'm just thinking about like um, you know, Bitcoin is a, a commodity ETF right now. Um, and they're saying that if you wanted to have an Ethereum like staking ETF, that would automatically make it kind of like a, a security, right? And so will will there ever be, you know, um, security ETFs that hold crypto or will they all just have to be commodities? Yeah, so it's it's nuanced, right? Um, I don't think that necessarily that would be the case that it would be a security if it uses staking. Like that's not my view. We have we have ETFs that have Ethereum and do staking in Canada and in Europe. Um, that mm. said, my view, I like I said, I'm pretty. I was positive. I was pro the ETFs being approved this year. I would be shocked if the SEC allows them to do staking. So it'd be an inefficient vehicle for getting exposure because I, I would be surprised if they let these issuers do staking, but only time will tell. Um, so that'll be something to watch. Um, but yeah, you basically need a market structure bill to like answer the questions you're asking for the most part. I mean, theoretically, if there's a market structure bill and they say these these digital assets are securities, you could easily just have an ETF and it, the underlying asset is accepted as security by the SEC, CFTC, and the industry. Then all of a sudden you have an ETF that holds an underlying digital asset security. Um, so that would be pretty standard. Um, for, so we basically need, I, I mentioned like the path for the, the Bitcoin ETF. And then I said, like, you kind of could have that path for Ethereum. There's nothing else out there right now that could follow that path. So the only way would be um, definitive court cases in the highest courts in land. So Ripple could be heading there potentially, but even then that's years off as far as I'm concerned. Um, so maybe you could get some other assets that are deemed to not be securities by the SEC. And then you could get an ETF possibly, maybe even then probably not because one of the reasons why the futures are important is because the SEC needs uh, a regulated market. Um, to basically surveil and look for any wrongdoings or and stuff like that. So you basically need futures or a regulated exchange 
uh, to come into uh, the SEC and share their data before they'd allowed anything to happen. So um, wow. there, there's a lot of different things that would need to happen before we get an ETF, which is why I, I think we're so far off from anything aside from Ethereum at this point. All right. And hey, like, uh, you know, we, we had the big buildup. It's been really active with the Bitcoin ETF. Now that like, right, you're you're the ETF specialist. You're not just like the Bitcoin ETF specialist. So your job, like you have met hundreds or thousands of other ETFs you have to cover. You got to get back to work too. These are kids you've maybe been neglecting for the last six months. Now that this is launched, do you stick around in the crypto space? Are you staying as active or are you going back to traditional kind of, uh, you know, tracking and analyzing? So it's funny, I actually have been like building essentially a tool tracking the entire asset management industry for ETFs and mutual funds in the US. And I started working on this before I even came to Bloomberg Intelligence, like fixing a lot of the data issues. I came from data in Bloomberg doing the back end stuff uh, that we've kind of hinted at here. Um, So I've been working on this since 2016. We have a tool that we're probably going to be launching um, this month. We're demoing it to clients now. Um, so I've always, I've continued doing stuff that's outside of this, but the vast majority of it has been covering this, but we're not going anywhere on this topic. There's still a lot of questions, a lot of things to cover. And like I said, this is kind of like a case study because even if you don't care about the underlying assets specifically, the fact that we have 10 ETFs launching, competing with marketing and fees cutting, uh, looking at liquidity and seeing who can get assets, it's, it's fascinating to cover. And then also we have the Ethereum filings to cover. Uh, so that's, that's not going away anytime soon. Um, yeah. So for the foreseeable future, we'll stay here. And then um, I guess we'll we'll have to see what happens uh, as far as the courts go or um, uh, the Congress even uh, getting rules out there. So I, I'm lucky enough to have colleagues that are lawyers and litigation analysts. So they've helped me with the Grayscale case. They're helping me cover what's going on with, with Coinbase and understand. So we have a team of people who cover both like some of these stocks from an equity analyst perspective, some of the stocks from a credit analyst perspective. Um, I have a policy expert who's down in DC who knows how like the ins and outs of Congress and how these different administrations work and <laughs> and different agencies. So like I'm fortunate enough to like, yeah, we've had a lot of right calls, but there's been a lot of people helping us in the back end confirming our beliefs or explaining different things to us uh, on what's going on. Um, so they, where it will, it'll probably die down. It'll go lower than the, the activity that we've seen, but it's not going anywhere anytime soon. <laughs> yeah. And I was going to say, just like lastly, on, on like the last thing on crypto, um, before I move on to the other stuff, um, you know, d- does crypto ever eat finance entirely? Um, you know, Mark Andreessen's kind of thing about, you know, software eating the world. Well, crypto's financial software eventually all of software or all of uh, the markets are going to be some type of blockchain or crypto. Do you kind of believe that future? Uh, I feel like it's way farther off than people are making it out to be in many cases. I think it's possible. Sure. I think tokenization of tons of different things is likely to happen just because of the efficiencies, which we've seen people complaining about um, uh, like the lag and seeing um, like literally just flows, but also like there's, there's always going to be overlap here. Um, so I'm probably, I'll take the under <laughs> on some of that, <laughs> but I think it'll happen on the fringes and it's already starting to happen with, with some funds. Um, we've already seen money market funds and things that are like operating on the platform uh, on the, on different blockchains to like keep track of who actually owns these shares rather than companies doing it. Uh, so wisdom tree is experimenting with that. Franklin has experimented with that. They were the first ones to do it. So there's a lot of things like that where blockchain tech will come into the TradFi space. But um, yeah, I don't really have like a super strong view on like what's going to happen with the tokenization of like real world assets and how big it's going to be. Um, this, that's veering a little bit out of my expertise. I obviously know about it and listen to it and talk to people about it, but I wouldn't consider myself an expert on that topic. So outside of crypto specifically, are there any other like interesting trends that are happening in the world right now that like you're paying attention to? <sighs> Too many to count, right? We we yeah. live in an interesting time right now. We really do. <laughs> I mean, obviously, um, AI, GLP-1 drugs, stuff like that. I'm, I'm paying attention to like, uh, I listen to a lot of macro and just broader financial podcasts and things like that. One of the areas in the ETF world that I, I'm very focused on or tangentially focused on is these structured product ETFs where they have like guaranteed um, buffer protection on the downside and you have capped upside. So you might be able to, you can get up to 50% return and in return, but if it goes above that, you don't get any more. Um, but you're also protected on the certain percentage on the downside. And that's one of the fastest growing um, areas of the ETF market. I mean, we're, we're covering um, 
I cover everything in the asset management space to be, yeah. to be fair. Mm-hmm. Uh, though the last month and a half has been <laughs> very, very focused on what we've been talking about. So like my brain is definitely a little atrophied on some of the, some of the more basic things uh, that we could be talking about. Yeah, no, I, I'm excited about things that are going on in crypto. And, you know, especially when you marry it with ETFs, because crypto is kind of like what I view as like, you know, maybe one of the fastest growing asset classes. Um, but also ETFs, I see, are, I don't know if you could call it an asset class, I guess a vehicle, an investment vehicle. They're like the fastest growing investment vehicle. I see they're gobbling up all this market share from mutual funds. Can you give us some numbers, some context around like how big the ETF market has become? how quickly and kind of where it's going. Yeah, I mean, in the US alone, it's the largest market by far, but there's over $8 trillion in, in ETFs. Wow. Um, and in in the mutual, if you compare that to like the mutual fund world, they make up around, oh, what's the number? Um, ETFs are roughly, here actually, I have the number in front of me, 30% of the total pie for um, mutual funds and ETFs together. Um, so our prediction is that ETFs will be as big as mutual funds um, by the end of the decade, by the end of 2030, we think. Um, so basically, the ETF wrappers, we, we view it as a technology. It's kind of an analog technology, but it really is the best way to get exposure uh, to markets in plenty of different asset classes. Um, so, but like if you look at, so excluding money market funds, which have about a little less than $6 trillion in assets right now, um, you have about 24, 25 trillion dollars in in mutual funds and ETFs that hold any gamut of things. Mostly, it's equities and bonds, but it also includes now Bitcoin ETFs. <laughs> so right. um, that's how big the the piece of the pie is. Um, and then if you take a bigger step back to some of those advisors I was talking about, uh, if you look at Cerulean Associates estimates, they say that like advisors, those people, the brokers, the platforms, uh, independent advisors, they have somewhere around 30 plus trillion dollars in assets. That doesn't wow. include like some brokers and different things like that. So um, there's a lot of money um, sloshing around in this space. Um, so even just taking a, a small slice of, of those pies um, could be meaningful for, for some of these assets in Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, when we're looking at the long term, James, like what are some of the most important demographic shifts that that you analyze when you're looking at maybe where to invest your money over the course of the next 30 years or so? Yeah, I'm pretty basic. Um, I do pretty much like the Vanguard Bogle <laughs> type, type strategy. Right? Baby, the, all weather. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, actually, it's way more equities than that because I'm only 32, but um, <laughs> but, but uh but for, for the most part, it's just said and forget. I'm also not allowed to like trade these things. I have to go through compliance if I'm going to buy anything, even an ETF. Ah. Um, so like I'm very restricted from being active in any of my investment decisions. Mm-hmm. And honestly, it's helped me because I just basically <laughs> put money into my 401k and my IRA and set it and forget it. I have some stocks here and there that I've bought and played with. I would imagine it, it, it's kind of like an ironic curse. Like the guy who knows the most about the markets <laughs> and like knows where all this shit's going. Ah, it's so close, but he can, he can't actually utilize it. But you can't. I mean, you're getting paid to do it and give the intelligence to a lot of other people. But yeah, you know, I'd be biased. Really, I'd yeah. I'd be very biased if I was able to do that. Like I believe me, I I tried to find a way <laughs> to to buy uh, GBTC when it was at the massive discount, and that was not allowed. So I couldn't take advantage of my call in any yeah. way whatsoever. So that well, stuck. Hey, but it, a lot, lucky a lot enough to us- get everything right. Yeah, no, on behalf of myself and a lot of the community, we thank you for sure for, for all of your reporting because we all definitely profited uh, a lot in Q4 and uh, it was crazy. Um, You said you, you listened to a lot of podcasts. I kind of would love some shout outs. I've been running dry on some material. Um, what are some of your favorites that you listen to? Oh. I wish you had given me time to. Rep- I, l- I really do listen to like a lot. We have our own podcast, Trillions, uh, that okay, Eric Altunas does that. And that's mostly just about ETFs. Um, but we've done a bunch on, on Bitcoin and crypto in general, just because that's where a lot of interest has been. Um, nice. But um, I listen to so many other. Um, if I had to throw other ones out there, um, I listen to Laura Shins Unchained a lot. I have Peter McCormick um, nice. and what Bitcoin did. Um, Peter's great. Laura's great. Um, I listened to Galaxy Brains with with Alex Thorne. 
Um, Odd Lots is a is one of the is a podcast within um, within Bloomberg that I listen to, and then we also have uh, Bloomberg Intelligence has their own podcast, Fic Focus, which is honestly it's it's more geared towards the traditional financial world, so it won't be probably won't be that interesting to many of your people. Uh, On the Brink with Nick Carter, Matt Walsh, I listen to oh, a yeah. lot. He's great. Um, Frank Chaparro. I know I'm good friends with Frank, so I listen to the scoop. And then Nate Geraci, who's been one of the main people outside of Bloomberg, who I've been interacting with on this coverage. He has a show called ETF Prime. It was the first ETF podcast. He started it in like, while well, I was still in high school, I think. <laughs> so, um, yeah, those are all the ones I listen to on on the uh, on the ETF front on a regular basis. And there's plenty of others. And then I have other ones that are non uh, ETF crypto related, like how I built this and um, nice. some other fitness and running stuff. I'm a, I'm a former track and field athlete. So I used to be a distance runner. So I still listen to a lot of things related to that, but those are the ones I all, I listen to mostly. And I, Oh, bankless occasionally I forgot as yep. well. They're good. Um, and then the daily, I listen to the daily pretty much every single day from New York times. <laughs> nice. Love it. Um, that was, well, hey, that was probably we... way more than you were expecting, but I, no. I, just li- I don't, I rarely down. listen to music. <laughs> I barely listen to music and I listen to a lot of podcasts and audiobooks. That's my number one thing that I do. Um, when I'm doing chores or driving, I, I commute to work every day. So that's what, that's Hell what yeah. I'm listening to. Well, Hey, well, hopefully uh, crypto 101 gets in the rotation there. <laughs> yeah, no, you guys are on the rotation. I just figured there was no point to Hell even yeah. add you guys. <laughs> Don't worry. You're, <laughs> uh, you're, you're in my, you're in my feed, but I figured there was no reason to even mention it considering where we are, but you guys are in my feed. I don't uh, listen to every episode, but I do uh, listen to a decent amount. If I see a guest that I like or a topic I'm interested yeah. in, I'll, I'll throw it on. <laughs> appreciate it, James. Hey, w- wish we could talk all day. We're coming up against the hour, man. And we, we really appreciate your time. Um, where, where can people follow you? If people want to hear more, learn more, keep up with uh, you know, the big product launch that you guys are going to be doing, um, where do we, we learn more about James Safer? Yeah, easiest way for the average person is just Twitter, J-S-E-Y-F-F, J Safe. It's my first initial, first few letters of my last name. <laughs> A lot of people just call me Jeff because it looks like that's what my name is. <laughs> but and, and watch out you, for the impersonators. I've never seen uh, as many impersonators oh. as you have. I don't understand why they're impersonating me. There's like literally like over. I've I've probably reported over a hundred, and then X you know slash Twitter minutes, made it more heart attacks I've had thinking I get a follow from James Safer. I'm like, oh my god, yeah, oh, oh my god, yeah, oh. <laughs> All right, I'll follow you right after this. Thank uh, you. Yeah, but like, no, it's wild how many there are out there. It's absolutely insane. But otherwise, if you're if you're um, if you're a terminal client, I can be reached on the terminal at any time. Um, pretty much, uh, I'm always available on there to talk. Um, and then we have, like I mentioned, Trillions podcast. We have our own show on, on Bloomberg. It's on Mondays at noon now called ETF IQ. Um, so that's where we're mostly active. But yeah, but all, all of my stuff is on, on the terminal and I share some of that on my Twitter as well. Um, and yeah, that's where, that's where you can find me. LinkedIn too, but I'm way less active there than Twitter. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, hey, James, thank you so much for coming on the show. Appreciate all the work you've been doing and and all the work that you have ahead of yourself. So um, thank you. And we'll talk to you soon. And hopefully you come back whenever you want. Anytime there's another big update. All right. Sounds good. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, you bet. 